Welcome everybody to the session Evolving Landscape of Competition Policy. I'm now going to turn it over to our moderator, Florian Ederer. Thank you very much, Michelle. Uh, thank you everybody for attending. Um, as Michelle said, this uh, is a panel on the evolving landscape of competition policy as part of the Navy conference. The way we'll run this panel is uh, we'll do some initial introduction of the panelists. Uh, I'll have some initial questions uh, for our panelists. They'll respond and then hopefully we'll also be able to answer a number of questions that you can send in as the audience. Please submit your questions by chat. I will pick out some of the questions and hand them over to our panelists who are of course very eager to answer them. So let me get uh, straight to the point and introduce our two excellent panelists. Uh, the first one is uh, Jinja Zhejin, who's currently a professor of economics at the University of Maryland at College Park. Uh, from 2015 to 2017, she was on leave at the Federal Trade Commission, serving as the director of the FTC Bureau of Economics. Uh, she was also on leave at Amazon in 2019 and 2020. She's currently the co-editor of the Journal of Economics and Management Strategy and an associate editor of the RAND Journal of Economics. Uh, Ginger is a widely published industrial organization economist, uh, and she's been a research associate of NBR since 2012. But uh, unlike many other academic economists, uh, she's also had her foot in uh, the, the private uh, corporate world because she's the co-founder of Hazel Analytics, an analytics company that promotes the use of open government data. Our second panelist is uh, Marty Gaynor, who's the E.J. Barone Professor of Economics and Public Policy at Carnegie Mellon University. Uh, he also is a former director of the Bureau of Economics at the U.S. Federal Trade Commission. His research focuses on competition and incentives in healthcare, and in particular on antitrust policy. Uh, he's one of the founders of the Healthcare Cost Institute, an independent nonpartisan nonprofit dedicated to advancing knowledge about the US healthcare spending. And he served as the first chair of its governing board. He's also an elected member of the National Academy of Medicine, the National Academy of Social In Insurance. He too is a research association of uh, NBR uh, in the Industrial Organization Group and an international research fellow at the University of Bristol. So I'm super delighted to have uh, both of them as panelists as part of this uh, uh, session. And I'll start off with one question that has really fascinated me over the last couple of years, because it's been a while since competition policy and antitrust economics have really taken such a prominent role in policy and in business discussions. And my real question then is, like, how come that antitrust is hip again? Uh, Ginger, why are we suddenly talking about antitrust and economic policy, uh, <laughs> economic competition policy again? Um, yeah, that's a very good question. I, I think there are several reasons. Um, I mean, one is some macro observations seems to point out that product market concentration, at least the measured at some national sector level, um, has increased over time. And there's some um, reports about increased profitability of firms, especially large firms, together with decline in the labor share of income, some rising inequality, social mobility seems going down, the productivity growth seems to be flat, and some even noted some decline in innovations. So I think those macro observations have um, at least a prime the background for a more active discussion about um, antitrust policies. Um, there are also other factors, for example, globalization, especially in the digital world, um, and some geopolitics, like different parts of the world have realized that maybe the domestic and international development in those digital um, industries have been uneven and some may even um, consider industry policy or other things um, that try to maybe drive a difference. Um, and there are also other concerns like privacy or data flow, I mean, obviously related to the development of digital world, but I, I feel like the world still haven't figured out exactly how to connect them or disconnect them. <laughs> so um, yeah, so, so that's sort of the few factors in my mind. Mm -hmm. Marty? Yeah. 
Yeah, well, I mean, the obvious answer is because Ginger and I are so cool um, that, <laughs> that everybody just wanted to jump on the path. So that's obviously not, at least in my case. I, I got to say, too, I'm, I'm still a little surprised by this as somebody who um, has been interested in working on antitrust now for decades. Um, it's honestly been a policy backwater. Um, it's something that was very boring, very uncool. Policy people didn't even know existed for the most part. And that has been flipped on its head, which is interesting to see. And I think in many ways is a good thing. So I think Ginger gave over a number of substantive reasons for this. I think some of it honestly also has to do with politics. And um, this is, again, I'm an economist, so I am not a political analyst, but I think also there's something like a number of folks who are in the progressive uh, 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 end of politics uh, sort of, uh, uh, Bernie Sanders, Elizabeth Warren, um, you know, philosophical uh, types, um, had become very, a number of years ago, became very concerned about big tech in particular, um, rightly or wrongly, and concerned about not just sort of uh, market power, but also uh, political power. And I think a number of these people uh, decided that antitrust was an area to push on uh, and that there was something to be accomplished uh, through a political agenda there. And, and, you know, again, I'm not taking a position right, wrong or indifferent, but I, I, I think there's also that element that got thrown into the mix a number of years ago, because prior to that, I would have said, you know, there are different uh, camps in antitrust, roughly people who are more hawkish and more dovish, um, but sort of took in many ways a very similar view of the world and would have looked at the kinds of things, say, Ginger, you were talking about a moment ago, and uh, a number of us would have felt, yes, you know, that actually tells, indicates we need more aggressive antitrust enforcement, but I don't think that would have made it hot. I think that this is the other um, other thing that emerged in the past few years that really has, has changed things very, very dramatically. Yeah, totally, uh, I agree. I, in many sense, I feel like um, have a more vigorous um, discussion about antitrust policies and even together with other policies is a good thing, right? That's we sort of like the whole society um, reckoning about um, what works, what doesn't work in this area and, and what could be improved. It just, unfortunately, I also feel like the same, um, the same trend is also going towards less evidence-based arguments is more sort of People taking sides or driven by um, driven by some sort of non fact based evidence that that to me I feel is an unfortunate direction. I, I agree with you, Ginger. I saw a question pop up from Zachary Winston about the the right, and yeah, that's also true. There's sort of a populist aspect to this, which again, you know, this is so interesting that um, there are folks to, on the right and folks on the left who are populists that might not agree on much of anything, but oddly enough, at least there's some agreement uh, on this. It does seem to be at least a, a winning position to take to some degree. Again, not necessarily supported by facts and uh, and and evidence. And, uh, you know, we could, we could talk through the entire session and some more uh, about this. So uh, folks have felt like there's rising concentration. That's true in some sectors. But upon a close, taking a closer look, you know what? That's not true um, across the board. And once you look more carefully at what would be relevant product in geographic markets, that sort of general tend, oh my gosh, we're being drowned by rising concentration. That's not true across the board. The rise in market power, we're, ge we're getting some more evidence on that. There, I think there's no question there is increasing market power in some sectors and some uh, geographic areas, but that's not, uh, I don't think we have the evidence to claim that's true across the board. Big tech, what's that, you know, one for them, you know, big tech is not big tech. Amazon and Microsoft um, are not in the same business for the most part, right? Um, and whatever issues there may be, with those companies, they're, they're not, it's not one set of issues. So there's a lot of things where I think the rhetoric has way outstripped, not just an analysis, but evidence. So uh, let, let's return maybe a little bit then to the evidence on all of this. Um, so the prominent tech and antitrust economist, Carl Shapiro at 
Berkeley has titled one of his recent articles, Antitrust, What Went Wrong and How to Fix It. Um, I want to ask our two panelists how well they think that antitrust enforcement is working in America. And uh, as a follow up on this, is it working equally well or badly for businesses, consumers and workers? So I'd say a two part question here, really, how well do you think antitrust enforcement is working? Is it working as well as it has worked in the past or is it working better even? Um, and then who is maybe being left behind uh, in terms of uh, this competition policy, businesses, consumers and workers? Marty, let, let me start with you this time. Okay, sure. So, uh, yeah, I think I think antitrust enforcement needs some attention. That's almost a non sequitur because almost every area needs needs some attention. But uh, I I think that a, a few things have happened over the past few decades. One thing is that uh, I think a large part of the problem has to do with the courts, and uh, the courts have, for a variety of reasons, moved in a direction where, um, in my view, it has become uh, unduly hard and uh, inefficiently hard uh, for plaintiffs to win a case. Now, it shouldn't, you know, plaintiffs should not be able to walk into court and just win. That would not be good. But, uh, but you can have a, slam, a case that should be a slam dunk and lose the case and be at serious risk of that. And part of that is courts um, have focused on a number of things that I think lead them in the wrong direction. Uh, one of those has to do with error, uh, uh, error cost analysis, which focuses on errors of commission. So if a court uh, blocks a merger or rules against uh, an alleged anti-competitive practice, courts have focused a lot on, on um, on the problem associated with false negatives or the harms they might do, and have ignored uh, errors of commission. Um, I, again, uh, for reasons that uh, I don't think make any sense uh, whatsoever. I think it's that's a bad way to to conduct oneself. Um, the uh, courts have been heavily influenced by arguments that market power is not enduring; the entry will erode away. Um, uh, profits from market power. Again, the evidence we have now been accumulating over time does not support that. Uh, they've been convinced by arguments that a lot of anti-competitive conduct or practices or alleged um, are actually not harmful. So say vertical or not non-horizontal non mergers, um, tying, things like that. Some of these things um, I, I want to be clear, I'm not saying they're harmful across the board, far from it. But the, the courts have been convinced that these things should be almost presumed to be um, efficient or pro-competitive. And that, that, give, that means that, uh, that when the agencies or a private entity goes to court, that, uh, it's very, very hard, almost impossible. And so if you look at the kinds of cases that the agencies bring, they're almost all horizontal merger cases. Um, some of those can be very hard for the court, the agency to win when they should. They don't bring cases in many areas where, in my view, um, uh, they're important cases to bring, but it's become extremely difficult because of the courts. The other thing, and actually I think this will segue probably into kind of things that, that Ginger um, uh, really has a lot of expertise is, um, there, you know, there are lots of new developments like information um, privacy, things like that. Um, I, I don't. I'm not faulting the agencies on on this stuff, but uh, but of course we, you know, fortunately we have a dynamic economy. Things are happening, and uh, and we need analysis and research and evidence to to keep to keep up with up with that. And that can be a real challenge, both for the enforcement agencies, but honestly also also for the courts. The courts are really um, in my view, way, way behind the times. They've made a number of very serious mistakes about things like two-sided markets, for example. I'm gonna stop at this and turn the floor over to Ginger. And of course, Ginger, you're not obligated to take up any of these particular issues, but uh, but I, I know that, that these are things that you have thought deeply about. Yeah, thanks so much, Marty. Um, I think that the court has done something right in the past decades, um, that is, be more open-minded to economics. Um, 
I think economics introduced sort of some principles and framework of how to think about the market. And I'm glad that the court has been open-minded to that. However, I think the problems you just mentioned, Marty, about the court system is they try to oversimplify things. I, I think economics tends to say it depends. Right? And sometimes the economists are joke that you can only say it depends. Um, but in some important areas, it depends. The, the factor that it depends on really matters. And um, however, however, the court um, for better or for worse, they tend to simplify things, right? That's okay, let's draw a line on this side, must be white on that side, it must be black, there's no room for gray. And, and this sort of reflected in the court system. And then um, also, it's sort of embedded in the procedure of cases. And for example, in the court often hung up in the black white definition of markets and while ignoring the um, the actual harms that we can demonstrate in theory and empirically um, for um, relevant parties, right? So when the court hung up in the market definition and the two sides cannot agree, and then often the decision just turns out moot because um, they're sort of being somehow distracted away from the real harm of under competitive behavior and while well, sort of leaving a, a trace and probably even implications of future cases on this sort of, to me, sometimes useless debate on the market definition. And we know that's the um, improvement in empirical estimation or in even theoretical uh, modeling is that we can handle more continuous market um, definitions, right? I mean, Martin, you know this very well, like two hospitals merge with each other and we know people can choose um, between them and, and the travel distance is a very important factor. And then it's definitely continuous. It's not saying that's one feet longer, you must be in the market <laughs> and one feet short, um, you're you're not in the market, but, but the course seems like sort of not um, very open to that yet. And so I feel like some flexibility in the course system and should, um, should improve. Um, on, on the tech area, definitely that's, I feel like the industry is moving so, so fast and so dynamic, which is a good thing in general, but I feel like the um, agencies are lagged behind. I mean, FTC had this um, section 6B authority to do industry studies and in my opinion, they probably should have more resources and do more often of that kind of studies. And DOJ probably should be given a similar power to do that study, given how dynamic industries are doing. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I agree, Ginger. I think that in my view, you may or may not agree with this, is that when you end up with situations like, such as you described, like wrangling over market delineation and the courts get confused, that tends to heavily favor defendants because of this predisposition of, of courts and their um, concern over um, errors of commission as opposed to errors of, of omission. I, I think actually an interesting question for us as economists is just sort of given the reality. So we, you know, if you go, if you end up in court, you will be in front of a judge who um, is not a specialist in antitrust, most likely, right? They may have heard a racketeering case the day before and hear a drug dealing case the day after. Um, they uh, may never have taken an economics course. And yet you, you have to give over these things. And I, I think we end up in situations exactly like that which you described in, in which if you can't um, give it over very clearly um, and in a, in a way the judge can understand, forget it, you're done. And that makes it hard to convey nuance too. Um, and, and so I, I think that's a real challenge for us as economists. Now, one possibility would be to change the system and have specialized antitrust courts. Some other countries do that and have people who are really well trained and, uh, and, and can sort of you know take on these, these more um, not just sophisticated, but realistic uh, and useful uh, analyses. But I think until we get there, we're, we kind of have to deal with with what we have. And it does favor um, a, a, um, a very definite position, right? I think that's implied in what you were saying. I, I also I think another point um, is that the agencies 
um, are in way over their ears. Um, their budgets have been basically flat, adjusted for inflation, and merger filings have gone like this. This is only horizontal mergers, nothing else. No, nothing else. They are, you know, they could barely keep up, and that means just enforcement. Now, if we're talking about research, and the point Ginger made is really important, is in order to do a good job serving the American public, research is a core function of the agencies. The FTC has this particular authority under the FTC Act to um, investigate things on front of research basis using subpoena power. Um, but if they don't have the time or the people, then they can't do it. And the DOJ doesn't have their authority. It would make sense to give them their authority. But unless their budgets are really, really substantially increased, none of this will, will matter at all. So, so let me probe you a little bit more on this. I'm, I'm getting here the sense that um, overall antitrust, the agencies are doing the best possible job they can. Um, and what they're doing is fine. Um, but we seem to be in an equilibrium where the courts are constraining very much what the agencies themselves can do. Now, do you see this hurting principally the businesses, consumers, or workers? Who is most affected by sort of this shift towards, I'd say, let me just frame it as defendant-friendly courts or defendant-friendly antitrust? Do you want to go first this time, Ginger? Uh, sure, yeah. Um, I think a lot of defendants are business um, in the system that Marty just described because it's defendant, pro-defendant, that tends to be um, pro-business, right? At least the business that under investigation. Um, I think the at least the US system is based on consumer welfare standard. Of course, there's a debate on how we define consumers. <laughs> um, um, yeah, um, but but in my mind, that's at least that would include the final consumers, right? Whether that include intermediate market consumers is another question. Whether it include the other side of, say, a platform, and um, those could be business users. They could be, and um, sometimes could be even be workers, like in Uber or Lyft. I, I think that's subject to, to debate, um, but. Um, in my opinion, and this opinion might be a little different from what um, Professor Carl Shapiro wrote in his piece, I'm not sure that the consumer welfare standards should be overturned to include workers, for example. I feel like there are a lot of um, labor laws that try to um, protect labor rights. And I mean, there may be debate on sort of how well they're doing the job, but I feel like um, wrapping worker welfare under antitrust could have um could generate some confusion that's now you're putting antitrust law in the position of balancing between um, worker welfare and um, consumer welfare and that raised question on say if consumer if, if a firm try to um adopt certain cost saving technology and that may say reduce the number of human workers it needed or um, it try to um, buy from a vendor that's um, using uh, fewer number of workers right <laughs> and so are we going to question that kind of business because it's going to generate some implication on worker welfare i just feel like if the society have not figured out how we're going to balance between worker welfare and consumer welfare. Just putting that under antitrust law is not going to solve the problem. It's just going to make the antitrust court really confused. And that could be backward rather than uh, moving forward. That's just my personal opinion. Yeah, just to be clear, I mean, I look, the, there are things the agencies can do better. I, I'm not saying that the FTC and the antitrust division are perfect, far from it, right? We can all, we can all do better. I do feel in my view, the courts are, are sort of the primary issue here. But yes, of course, um, the Federal Trade Commission, the Antitrust Division, Department of Justice can can do a better job in in, uh, in a number a number of areas. Um, yeah, as far as this goes, I'd say um, uh, you know pro defendant courts um, benefit at least in the short run businesses that are defendants, but it can harm other businesses. So if there are other businesses that are rivals that are being harmed by these practices, and remember also we're talking about um, cases that are not brought 
particularly um, anti-competitive conduct cases, then uh, then there if there are firms that are being harmed by this, um, they're, then they're not, uh, then that's a problem. Now, bear in mind, of course, the um, purpose of the antitrust laws is to protect competition, not competitors. So the goal is not to help out competitors, but if conduct is being permitted or not stopped that harms competition, and it does, and it is going to harm some firms too, then they're being harmed along the way. Um, so I would say that the standard should be harm to competition in the relevant market. Now, in some cases, um, that's going to mean harm to consumers, people who are uh, purchasers of final products or even intermediate products. And I think that's a relevant standard. It should not be a total social welfare standard for the simple reason that if you're exercising market power and as a result of that, you increase your profits under a social welfare standard, that gets counted. And that seems to me completely contrary to the intent of the antitrust laws. So, um, but as far as workers or basically, you know, sellers go, when we're talking about harm to competition in the market for purchasing something, whether it's um, chicken processing companies purchasing chickens from chicken farmers, whether it's employers purchasing labor services from workers, if there's harm to competition, in my view, that falls directly under antitrust and it's harm to the um, trading partners on the other side of that market. So in some cases, yes, that will that will be workers. And in that case, I think that absolutely falls under um, uh, antitrust enforcement. It's something that uh, that the agencies and, and the courts should take into account. I, I think Ginger and I might have been talking about somewhat different matters here. Um, if there's say a merger, and as a result of that merger, um, there's no harm to competition, but um, automation ensues and workers lose their job. I mean, that's that's bad for workers, no question. They are harmed. Um, but if that didn't result as a harm to competition in the market for labor services, if that market, uh, the merger didn't harm that competition there, then I don't think there's an antitrust enforcement problem. We have a social policy issue here. But I think the other thing to bear in mind is um, antitrust enforcement can't do everything. It's not designed to do that, shouldn't do that. You know, the old Saturday night sketch, it's a dessert topping and a floor wax. Well, it, it, it's, I don't think it's an anti, it's, a, it's, it's not a floor wax, maybe it's a dessert topping. But, um, but it, you know, to ask antitrust enforcement, as some people are saying, look, it should take care of consumers. It should take care of all kinds of problems in the labor markets. It should take care of, uh, of uh, wage stagnation. It should take care of political power. I, I think I think that's unrealistic. Um, you know, it's not that those are not issues. We all agree those are really important issues for our society. But to put all your eggs in the antitrust enforcement basket and expect that, I, I think is, is just not uh, realistic and is counterproductive. Yeah, let me add one additional thing here is, you know, one of the high profile labor cases in antitrust has been, of course, you know, one that's very relevant to this conference, the sort of a no cold call hiring lists uh, that the tech companies agreed on, and which on which they were very aggressively prosecuted on which and which on which they settled also, or more recent cases between Duke and UNC of not hiring faculty from each other, which of course, you know, affects us as academic economists, that also has been very active enforcement by the antitrust agencies very much just under this this completely usual uh, uh consumer welfare standard it's straight up collusion and that's illegal and you just you're just not permitted to do that it shouldn't be permitted under your circumstances now doj just filed a case against uh some major book publishers in terms of their publishing material from authors so that is a monopsony uh, you know, labor case, and it'll be interesting to see how that proceeds. I think there, Ginger or Florian, you may know this better than, than I. I don't, there have been, I think, some antitrust cages where the merger aspect um, was about uh, monopsony power, but I, I don't think it's a very large number. I'm not a legal scholar, so. So there have, there have been very small, uh, a few small cases on this, but it's been mostly a sideshow. So this, so I think this new monopsony case between Penguin and uh, and Simon Schuster is going to be very interesting in terms of where we're heading. I want to turn over to some of the very interesting questions that have been asked in the chat. Um, I'll start off with the first one uh, from Michael Einhorn, 
who asks, what is an example of a bad court decision involving two-sided markets and why? And since Marty said that, you know, he's seen some very bad decisions there, particularly on the two-sided market, something that is very relevant to uh, tech platforms in particular, I want to turn it over to him. I will just preface it. I know one very, very bad decision. And so I'm, I'm, I'm pretty sure that Marty is thinking of the same very bad decision. Well, I'll just say the the American Express Supreme Court decision and Ginger and Florian, and you should jump on this briefly. Um, the court didn't understand two sided markets. And, uh, you know, because of the restriction, um, even though consumers were directly harmed, they said that wasn't enough. And um, I, I think you know, they're just. Uh, the court reflected a, a very poor understanding of how these markets work and, um, of course, how uh, uh, how much damage that will ultimately cause, uh, you know, is, is a bit hard to say. Again, I, I'm not an expert on on, on legal matters, but uh, but that's something where uh, I guess, you know, very, you know, th there was a lot of economic uh, evidence and testimony presented uh, by very, very good economists. On uh, on both sides, um, my view is the court made a bad decision. They really didn't understand things, and since it's a Supreme Court, um, it can have far-reaching consequences. But I'll, I'll turn it over to, uh, to to Ginger and Florian. That's the example in my mind <laughs> as well. Um, I, I think that's also an example where the court sort of hung up in the market definition and ignore. Um, the real harm there, right? And it, the Supreme Court decision, uh, as I read, it's like the court was saying you have to consider both sides for transaction platform. I don't know whether this is going to sort of define transaction platform as a new phrase different from typical platform or not. So, so that's something um, worth watching. It, to me, another um, sort of um, caveat of that decision is it doesn't give us any guidance of how you're going to incorporate the two sides, right? That's okay. Even if we accept your argument that we should consider a multiple size for um, multiple size market, but how to, like how to weigh the welfare on both sides? What kind of trade-off is allowed? What kind of trade-off is not allowed? It was not said at all in that decision. Right. But I mean, Ginger, just coming back to the, something you raised earlier, right, about sort of economic evidence and analysis. I mean, there was a lot of analysis and done by, you know, really, really good people. Um, and yet, here's where we ended up. <laughs> but it was most like quite deciding that they weren't going to go listen to any of that good economic evidence to some extent. Yeah. I mean, I was thinking, of course, exactly of the same case, um, I, um, I've, uh, Carl Shapiro has put them as sort of four very bad decisions uh, that maybe need to be overturned. I have uh, jokingly called them as the four horsemen of the antitrust ap apocalypse, um, and Amex is certainly one of them. Now, uh, I want to go and go a little bit further, since we mentioned here issues of adversarial precedent. Uh, John Lazarev in the audience uh, asks the following question. What do you think will be the state of antitrust law four years from today? Uh, let me broaden that, not just antitrust law, but antitrust enforcement four years from today. Are you worried that the agencies will bring economics free cases, lose them, and then get stuck with the adversarial presidents for decades uh, to go in the future? <laughs> yes. Um, John is <laughs> asking some very good questions here. Yeah. Um, that's a really good question. I, I think, honestly, that um, Good economic analysis and evidence will be will be necessary uh, four years from today, just like it is today. I am worried that the agencies might uh, go down a path where they uh, don't use uh, economics, they don't use good economics, and that will harm them. Um, I can't say what will happen, but I think you know people at the agencies will realize that if you want to win in court, um, and I presume they, and I'm I'm hoping that when they bring a case, they want to win it. Um, that they need to use all the resources at their disposal and all the evidence, and that will include um, economics as a very, very important component. Now, we'll, that remains to uh, to be seen. But yeah, you know, I think for for folks at this conference, business economists, it's something to really pay attention to. Um, in some cases, right, firms that you work for will be directly affected by this, either because they might be potential defendants and being aware of the kind of things that could be problematic, but also um, uh, they might be harmed by actions by other firms. 
in uh, in the industry. And so having a good sense of that and uh, and the kind of analysis that can that can support um, you know what what might happen in uh, an antitrust context, I think, is something very important. I feel like there's a certain amount of uncertainty in front of us in this sort of turning point of policymaking in, in competition. That's, um, it seems like there are a lot of opinions um, from the left to the right on this. And I'm, I'm just sort of, um, maybe I'm too pessimistic here. I'm just hoping that economics would not be marginalized in this um, political um, debate. Because um, I feel like the future industry with all the um, tech and other innovations going on, I mean, the evidence will be even more important than before when we try to figure out what is harmful, what is pro-competitive. A hundred percent. And uh, and I think, uh, I think that, I think, again, if you want to win in court, I, I, I think you omit economics or, or sort of careful economics at your peril. We'll see what path the agencies are, are going to take. Hopefully, they don't go down a, go down a, a, a wrong path on this. And I think just to emphasize something you said at the end, Ginger, it's about making good decisions. It's not about necessarily like prosecuting and trying to you know, win everything. It's deciding you know when there is really a problem and when there isn't. And um, and and because you know. Not every merger, actually, probably most mergers, are are benign or beneficial. They don't harm competition. Maybe even they they promote competition. Um, there's a lot of conduct again that is efficiency enhancing, um, and, and and we don't want um, we want antitrust enforcement to help the economy function better, right? Not to uh, actually act as as a, as a break on the functioning of the economy. I want to turn uh, again to another uh, question here that's directly related to some of the tech issues that both of our panelists have highlighted. Tamar Chetin asks uh, whether we need new tools or new market definitions to handle some of the tech or uh, innovation-driven industries that have brought new antitrust issues that perhaps we haven't seen before. In other words, do we need more radical innovative antitrust perspectives and tools to handle some of these new antitrust challenges? Or is there enough in our toolkit, other than maybe fixing the courts, um, that we that you would propose uh, improving? Maybe I'll start with Ginger this time. Yeah, that, that's a very good question. I think it's a hotly debated question <laughs> around the globe. Um, I feel like, um, as I said before, I feel like the whole system should not be so hung up with market definition. Because um, if we look at the history of economy development, at least in the US, I feel like competition is enhanced when um, the firms find it easier to expand in geography or in um, product and space, right? That, that would mean that some historical definition of market may not apply in the near future. So um, just sort of viewing market definition is the absolute necessary um, condition before we even consider uh, anti-competitive behavior or potential theory of harm, I feel like that's not necessary. Um, that being said, I do feel like the tech, um, especially algorithm-driven um, market developments, does increase the scalability of um, many things, right? It could be that yesterday was a very small firm, but because this scalability, it could grow fast, it could grow very fast and become big um, tomorrow. So this process has been shortened because of technology. And in that sense, I feel like the current law on especially HSR and threshold for merger review is out of date. And I feel like we should lower the threshold or even get rid of the threshold and um, have the agency's mind more open to the potential um, anti-competitive um, mergers um, could be horizontal, could be vertical, right? And not just looking at the very, very large size, because given the scalability, that's the, the danger of certain small scale merger could hurt um, the future competition is, is greater in my mind. Yeah, I, th I, I agree. Those those are all, all important important points and uh, I think it is 
it is a, a challenge. I, I, I think, you know, there's some virtue to having presumptions um, because they can they can be efficiency enhancing um, in terms of just also the amount of time and the legal uh, legal costs associated with things. But, you know, these can be a two edged sword as as well, and particularly um, structural presumption uh, about market share, market concentration. Of course, you got to do market definition or do these things. And it has led to, I agree, an undue focus uh, on that. But again, I just want to say also, on the other hand, I mean, that can be uh, valuable under under some circumstances. It's it's not always distracting us away from, uh, from where we want to be. I think as economists, you know, we kind of think, well, we should just analyze everything. Like, what's this per se stuff, right? We should always like, you know, one hand, uh, other hand. Um, the problem is, or again, just in a larger economic framework, the costs and benefits of the whole thing, sometimes that doesn't work out. That that's uh, that's worth doing, and then again we're dealing. Uh, maybe I'm being unfair to courts here, but we're dealing with courts who are not well equipped to um, understand or address these kinds of, of things. And so I think a big question is how do we get from here to there? Because I, I agree with you, Ginger, but I think as a as a practical matter, it can be sometimes extremely difficult to mm -hmm. uh, to penetrate that uh, that kind of thing. Yeah, I agree. And sometimes presumption will be will be good. Um, it's on one hand, it will provide bright lines to businesses, right? That's they will know what to do, what not to do, without worrying about the huge litigation and bill, for example. But on the other hand, I, I think there must be a system to make sure first the presumption is based on very good evidence, very systematic evidence to support that presumption. And second, if future evidence comes by, there should be an easy way to revisit this presumption. That's, I mean, we can't just rely on say the law would sort of code this presumption in, and then it's just impossible to change that 20 years down the road. And then right. in that case, I, I'm just afraid that's the potential harm that alone could generate <laughs> might be even bigger than the problem is trying to target um, in the first place. So there must be some sort of well thought mechanism design there to, <laughs> to allow sort of new evidence to allow um, sort of fast correction of mistakes. Great. So we have uh, three minutes left. I want to squeeze in one more question from Mike Luca because it speaks very much to what we've been discussing here since this is a, so in some way a public outreach panel. Um, Mike uh, asked whether there are other steps that the academic, academic and policy community can take to help the courts or generally I think antitrust policy to get it right more often. Is there need for more synthesizing translational articles? Do we need more research and frameworks? Do we need to have more of these panels here? Uh, that sort of communicate between research and practice. Do you have thoughts uh, on on that, other than saying yes, we need more of that? So um, I'll be I'll try to be very brief. I want to give Ginger some time too. I think yes, I can think of like um, an area I've done a work on uh, hospitals. Uh, academic research made a huge difference. Research at the FTC made a huge difference, and um, you can publish something in Econometrica or AER or JP, right? And policymakers will not know it ever happened. Nobody outside of our circle of academic researchers will know it happened. It doesn't mean it's not important, right? That's, that's necessary, but not sufficient. So we need scientific research in peer reviewed uh, journals, right? Good stuff. But then also just, I think what Mike is saying, yeah, we need translational stuff as well. Now that's can be kind of hard for academics to do, particularly pre-tenure, uh, because yeah, Florian's not, a, yeah, I ain't doing that. Um, <laughs> but, um, but, but, uh, but perhaps like NABE convening panels like this, uh, or really trying to get people together to talk about what's the evidence on what's happening in tech markets. What about disintermediation of workers in sort of the gig economy, stuff like that. And, and do, doing that in a forum where that can be given over to, uh, to non-specialists so that, that actually they understand that. I think that is very important and that can have a real impact. Great. Ginger, closing words for the last minute. 
Yeah, absolutely. To answer uh, Mike's question, absolutely. I, I totally agree. Uh, not only senior faculties like us uh, should um, sort of free up some time and do this translational interdisciplinary work. I think economists working in the business world has that role as well, right? That's you are in the field, you work with non-economists day in and day out. You probably even work with lawyers. Um, inside your firm or, or uh, attend a conference um, and, and, and see sort of um, how they, how they um, business economists think about things. I, I think that translation, that educational effort, it's, it's important, like write things in English, not in Greek letters. <laughs> it <laughs> actually goes a long way to sort of um, get the message, um, get the message out, right? Not just sort of sort of show off that you understand that Greek equation. I, I think that's really, really important. Excellent. So we've come uh, to the end of our session. Thank you so much to our two uh, panelists. Thank you so much to everybody who asked questions. I'm sorry I couldn't get to all of the fabulous questions that you had, but please feel free to reach out to the panelists also, maybe to chat with them directly uh, by email. Thank you again for coming and enjoy the rest of the Navy conference. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks for thanks for having us. Great to be on the panel with Ginger and with uh, with you, Florian. Yep. Thank you for having me.